Hello. Hello, everybody. Happy July. Already. Yes. <laughs> we are, um, we have so much to talk about today. Um, so let us know if you're here and um, ready to chat with us about color. We have so much to talk about. Um, and um, we also have some uh, information for those of you who have been asking about our website and what's going on with that. Um, but could you just turn up the lights just a little bit, please? Oh, sure. It's a little dim over here. Um, so uh, let us know if you are, looks like we've got, oh, good morning, Nancy's here. Okay, so we've got um, uh, lots to uh, get through, so we're gonna dive in pretty quickly. Um, I think the first thing I want to uh, talk about is we have a lot of questions. We've been getting a lot of questions about our website and when it's going to be up and um, just Reader's Digest version of what happened. Uh, when you run a small e-commerce business, you are reliant on a credit card processing company. There's no problem with our website. The problem is on the credit card processing companies end yeah. um, which seems to be short staffed I guess it's it's one of the largest processing companies in the country um, but they have such limited hours right now yes and so it's 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 very challenging we just have to wait our turn um, there are people bad actors who steal credit cards and then try to uh, run them through small businesses we have all of the security elements up on our website. Yeah. So your your cards are fine. They don't get in. Yeah. They don't get in. <laughs> um, but it then the, the credit card processor has to do an invest investigation and that takes time and we can't process credit cards until yeah. then. So the website is is fine. There's it's no, fine. There's no issue safe. with that. Yeah. The problem is that's why you can get to the lodge and things like that. Right. It's the credit card processing company. We're waiting for them to finish the uh, whatever they need to do to get us up and running. This so. is um, this is a common situation with small um, e-commerce businesses and it's a headache. Yeah, we, we sure. believe me, we'd rather be quilting. <laughs> well, and we'd rather be, you know, it's the worst thing for us to be in the middle of a quilt along and they have to close yeah. down our, our, um, our registration. Right, everything. that's, so, you know, we're at the lodge is still open. Yeah. For, for those so, of you in the quilt along who know what that is. So um, as soon as we know, when it'll be back up, we'll let you know, but we don't know in the meantime. So, um, uh, so please gonna, be with it, yeah. bear with us. Um, and so we're going to be talking about color today. Um, and I asked for, um, I asked, I invited questions about 90% of them, I would say, <laughs> are what can be answered in either the palette building one video on our YouTube channel, the palette building two video on our YouTube channel, or for those of you who are doing the summer camp mystery quilt along, um, the first we the first video answers a lot of those questions, but we will briefly run through. Yeah, we'll run through things yeah. still. So, um, so the first question um, we uh, I got was, can you add colors midstream? Um, and we addressed that in the installment four video. And that, that, that's a question with the quilt along for with those who are along. doing the mystery quilt. But it also is a question really for any project. If, right. In the middle of a project, can you add colors? And if so, like how late can you add colors? And the, um, the general advice is that the earlier the better, um, but you can add colors as long as you don't lose your way. And um, if there's background fabric, if there's sashing, um, you don't wanna wait until you've finished all the blocks mm -hmm. to choose that fabric because um, you need to carve out a value or a, or, hue. or a hue for that uh, color, um, for that background, or else you, you're not 
you're not going to have a unified, cohesive quilt. And I, yeah, I, I think in general, this question of plan comes to an, a question of planning, which is that when we make quilts, we do try to make the decisions about what fabrics we're using. We even think about how we're quilting a quilt ahead of time. But it's true that as you work on something, things evolve and sometimes you, you see new opportunities. And so you can absolutely make changes, as we said, midstream, but you want to be intentional about it. You want to think about how that will impact the final design and you just be, be thoughtful. I think just in kind of the most broad brush way, within the, um, the summer camp modern mystery quilt along, and um, there are many people in the modern quilt studio fabrics or patterns and fabrics group who um, either either misinterpreted or ignored mm -hmm. our, our suggestion that you could wait a little bit longer. We said you need to have one or two that you've, uh, you've selected as options as yeah. options at the beginning. I think, remember we said we need, you need to make a space for them in your palette. Um, and maybe they, they thought that meant they don't have to think about it. But now what they've done is they've, they've got a whole wide range of colors of hues and a whole wide range of values in their blocks in their blocks and there's no, there's no, there's no value or hue available mm. for the background. Yeah. So that is the recurring uh, yeah. challenge I'm seeing in the group. And I, I, I would agree. I think that just goes back to think it through, keep a space for that contrasting sashing or edge or whatever it's going to be. And that would apply to any quilt that, that uses a background fabric like that. Yeah, and and I'm still going to adjust the light. Yes, please talking. do. It's just I was goofy. like, I don't know. What. <laughs> yeah, I thought the light looked a little odd. It's very odd um, today. So the um, that is the so real. That's much better. If you have um, the other challenge is that there are people who used a painting or a photograph or something, mm. and they just pulled all of the colors from the photograph or the painting or whatever. And um, the it was all the full spectrum of color, the full, full spectrum of value. Yeah. And that's, you know, we, we tried to explain you, you can't, you can't do it all. Well, so, I, I think one of the challenges, um, when you look at a painting you love or a photograph you love and you pull colors, and there are actually apps that do this. You take a picture mm -hmm. and it shows you the six main colors or the 10 main colors. The challenge with using that is that it will absolutely give you a, probably a beautiful palette, but it doesn't take into account the role of those colors. Or proportion. Or proportion. So if you take a painting that you love and you take a, uh, take the t 12 colors from it that you love and you compare those 12 colors as 12 squares to the painting, you might actually just have a tiny bit of lime green in the painting, but an equal proportion of it when you put a swatch of it down. And similarly, in most paintings, there isn't a solid background or continuous background the way there is in many quilts that have sashing. So, it will, you know, looking at a painting that way is a great exercise in palette building, but it's only one step because it doesn't take into account that role. And so you, you, you can do that and then maybe pull one of those fabrics out of the palette and consider it as a background. But if you use them all in blocks that are going to be surrounded, it's, it's tricky. Yeah, I think in general, it's just hard to use the entire color wheel, and then all of the values from light to dark. Um, it's just really hard to kind of make that look cohesive. Yeah, and I am seeing May's comment that she says she stalled on a quilt because the sashing wasn't right. And after watching the palette video, she found a color that worked. That, that makes me happy because 
I, I think it's great to know that you can revisit and sometimes the color that works is not intuitive. I mean, we've done quite a number of colorful quilts where the color that worked was an army drab, a kind of olive drab, or was a, a blue gray that was quite unexpected. So it's, it's great when you're stalled, you might set it aside, revisit it, and I'm glad that video was helpful. Somebody else asked about how many colors. Um, I think in the pattern we said 15 or 16 yes. was the minimum. Um, and then I said more colors makes it easier to lay out. That's, I guess to me, that that um, implied within a cohesive palette. Uh, yes. Because if you, if you, more colors doesn't mean just anything works. No, so you know, look, it, yeah, yeah, basically, if you, if you have a palette of 16 colors, you could add six more that are just slightly different from the 16 you started with, which will add richness rather than six or 10 more that are wildly different. But I think if, you, if you're gonna add other colors, look at your lightest and darkest fabrics and look at the hue range you have mm -hmm. and put them inside that line. That's a good way to do it. Yeah. 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 They, they need to be inside. So don't like, I think somebody had a lighter value palette and then suddenly added chocolate brown and it's like, no, 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 you need that for your background. That would be a great background. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so it isn't, there isn't a magic number in terms of colors. It's the cohesiveness that you're looking for. Yeah. So I'm um, glad those videos have been helpful. Also, Kathy, thank you for letting us know. Yep. Um, th there was a question, if my blocks are saturated, uh, should the background be muted or less saturated? I'd again send you to the palette building um, video because that is the best way to understand. Um, there isn't a formula. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, just to sort of step back for a minute, um, we get so many questions from people who just want an answer. Just give me an answer. <laughs> and it's a natural thing yeah, yeah. to want to think that there is like it's a math problem. We're not withholding information. We're not. <laughs> we're not. It, it, a lot of it is that, um, you know, we can give you suggestions through the videos, um, but sometimes your background isn't the issue. It's one color that's creating problems that's too saturated mm -hmm. or too dark or too light within your palette. And it would be easier, you know, it, it, it's, you need to edit the palette first to then figure out the background fabric. It, it's a complex thing. And I, I think that our goal when we design quilts with, which have so many colors yeah. is, we're not making it easy, but we're making it an opportunity for discovery. And I think even that question that if you have, say, a saturated palette, what's a good background fabric? If you experiment, one thing you'll see is a more desaturated background will probably make those saturated colors feel like luminous and it will give a lovely contrast. If you have a bright background fabric with bright blocks, it will be very bright. And if that's what you're after, that's successful, but it, it's always what is your intention. The, so basically, it's not, there isn't a should. Yeah. And, and we don't wanna, I, I mentioned this in the campfire chat for those of you who were there for that. Um, sometimes people will ask us questions and we'll give them advice and then somebody else will say look here's an example of something that you said it wouldn't work and it worked and and like we just don't want to get into that <laughs> you know it, it's where there isn't one answer there isn't one approach in general we give you the we give you guidelines for the most number of people right the easiest way to understand it a desaturated background often is a good exactly. option. It's not the only option. And it doesn't always work. Yeah. So it's kind of an, uh, 
this is a good thing to try. It's, it's and, yeah. And uh, I see, Laura, you're asking, can a pattern fabric make up for value in a field fabric? If you're talking about something adding contrast, the, the main goal of your field fabric in our camp, summer camp quilt along, or many quilts that have sashing, is to provide edge and contrast that differentiates the units or blocks that are in it. I don't think a lot of people understand when you when you say edge. edge. I, I don't think that I, I think so, that they mean contrast. I think contrast. That's design speak. <laughs> I'm sorry, but but what I mean is basically, if you set a square on a field fabric, you should often you want to clearly see the edges of that square. It's through contrast. Through contrast, and so the question: Would a pattern fabric make up for it? The answer is very, a little ambiguous. It depends on the pattern fabric and usually, you have to test it. But usually, if, if you look at the palette building part two video, mm -hmm. um, as a general rule, pattern fabric doesn't work super well for background fabrics because the role of a background fabric is to be the background singer. We see. <laughs> yes. And that um, patterned obviously depends what level of pattern, but like tone on tone works fine usually. Um, somebody somebody is like, but I want to use a black and white print. Well, we'll use a black and white print then. But that you're making you're making it more challenging. It's more challenging to pull off. It's not impossible, but it's mm -hmm. more challenging to pull off. So the the if you're saying a patterned patterned fabric can't make up for value, I'm not. I don't really I understand don't totally. what what that means. But um, I think if you're asking, if you're using, a, a lot of people have if, who are using solids in the main piecing have wanted to use a co a coordinating print for the background, and we wouldn't recommend that. Right. Because it will be very distracting. However, um, you know, it's your quilt and feel free to disregard that advice. But in general, it's kind of, it, it's kind of, the advice we give is kind of the opposite of the traditional right, quilt world is. with borders where, where they're like, now put a big, huge scale print on the border and use the colors that are already in the quilt right but and then all you'll notice is the border because right. there's so much of it and the scale is really big and so if your patchwork you know the piecework you've done is what you want to show off then everything that is around it needs to be in a more kind of subdued um, yes <laughs> subdued background role and yeah, and I think Kathy, in your comment, I think you understand well, you said clarify then, if I'm thinking about either a deep plum or the marine blue for your field, you ask, does that mean I might want to be careful about purples and blues in your palette or just the more saturated ones? I think you want to be careful of the ones that are too similar to the background fabric you're thinking of in hue, and value. So if you have a an eggplant and in saturation. And saturation. If you have an eggplant field, you if you look at the fabrics in your palette and you put some of them on top of them, the eggplant, if they kind of disappear a bit into it, they're not right. You basically want any fabric that you lay on top of that background field to still be visible when you just set From a ten piece. feet away. Yeah, from 10 feet yeah, away. Yeah, from 10 feet. Not, not this distance. So that but then it has contrast. But I, it seems like, yes, you understand well. Um, someone, and, oh. there was a question about um, somebody being unaccustomed to cutting with small pieces. And um, uh, I suggest that you use uh, Best Press as we don't have any gig with them. It's just a way to keep your fabric more flat. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit easy to wrangle small pieces um, and helps you cut more carefully. Yeah. Um, we also had another question. This is not about color, but um, somebody needed this the answer mm -hmm. to this about chipping the ends of her rulers. Um, there are a couple of 
quick tips for that. Um, one is your cutting posture, um, yeah. which is that um, in classes, I'm going to turn to the side a little bit. I see people standing upright and then cutting this way. Um, if you use your body's momentum to lean and put your weight with your hand, um, you have a lot more control over the blade and the, if, if you're chipping the corners of your rulers, it's a sign to me that you don't have full control. So maybe yeah. adjust your body mechanics or change your blade. And I think one other thing, so I totally agree with our posture issue, but make sure that you're holding it so the blade is perpendicular to the ruler. If you think the ruler's edge is a perfect right angle, and I often see people cutting with a blade that's slightly crooked, which means it's going to try to go into that ruler. If it's perfectly straight, it, it can't get any grab on that edge. And I, I know exactly what you, you are yeah. struggling with, and I've seen people chip rulers a lot. The other thing, just to be careful, is every now and then, it's a sign that you're getting tired. And don't please don't cut when you're tired yeah, if that absolutely. because uh, honestly i think that caution and body awareness is something that can go when you're tired and so maybe you say to yourself i'm going to do the cutting where i'm a little more alert it may not have anything to do with it but it's just something i'd be careful of yeah. and can i add one yeah. more thing that when i saw that comment i wanted to mention uh the rulers that we designed for brewer sewing, the good measure rulers, have this really lovely anti-slip surface. And if you use our trimming rulers, or honestly any that have a non-slip surface, one of the most important things when you're doing, working with intensive trimming like we are right now on our quilt, is just wash it with gentle soap and water, maybe once a week, no matter how clean it looks, it's such a fine micro texture that cotton fibers will make any non-slip surface get slippery within a week of heavy use. And just super quick, soap and water, dry it off, and it's like new. Um, there were some questions about um, placement of blocks and colors and blocks and the explain the toss the salad mm -hmm. metaphor um, that we had um, talked about in the beginning of the fabric selection videos. So um, the toss the salad uh, um, idea was in editing your palette to, to lay everything out um, and to edit according to like a lot of people will line up all the blues, line up all the greens, yeah. line up all the reds. Which isn't how... And yeah. that's not how it's going to appear in the quilt. So what we were suggesting was that you toss the salad, meaning lay out the, the fabrics and the colors in um, not arranged so you can see, you can edit your palette. And then make sure that you have a really well edited palette before you start cutting and sewing. And um, uh, then you can put uh, blocks, you can, not, it's not random, but you can be less worried about the placement of a particular fabric within the quilt if you have already have a cohesive fabric or a palette. Now, in general, you're going to when you're when you're making blocks um unless there's this this is just for this particular pattern but um it's a good idea to avoid putting a yellow with a yellow and a red with a red and a blue with a blue because the contrast in the final quilt will be hard to see within the block it'll mm -hmm. look like a bunch of squares a yellow square, a red square, a green square, a blue square, you won't really be able to see the patchwork that so much. So toss that salad. So that was the idea of toss the salad. It doesn't mean that uh, 
like if you are using your palette relatively uniformly throughout the quilt, then it'll be easier for you to lay out. Yeah. If you have three yellow and yellow blocks and, um, you know, if you've divided up your blocks by hue and you have kind of blue blocks and green blocks and yellow blocks and pink blocks, it's going to be harder to lay out because the, the, the just amount of colors will be, be larger. Yeah. And I, I was just seeing Karen's comment that you appreciate the videos and the guidance and that you're enjoying this choose your own adventure. I also really appreciate that you, you totally understand that people, you know, we're, we're making a space for people to make selections and create and they will do what they want to do. And, and I'm, the fact that you're loving the adventure, uh, you know, you're, you're wonderfully open to this, which is our goal. So thank you. Um, so there, uh, it kind of goes back to another question was about um, the, the kind of following up on the challenge of using a focus fabric to pull your palette or using something else. If you, if you want to do that, just make sure that you've got a background fabric that's going to give you good contrast. And if you've already made enough, a, a bunch of blocks and you're looking at your blocks and they are a wide range of hues and a wide range of values, you might want to remove blocks that have the lightest, the brightest, the darkest, or the dustiest fabrics and see if it looks a little bit more cohesive. Just extremes. You, can... might, you, might, you can still edit even if you've made the blocks, yeah. um, but, but often it's the darkest or the lightest. If you just remove one of those, it doesn't have to be both. No, no. Yeah, um, it'll make it a lot easier to edit. Um, someone asked about whether um, the contrast needed to be in terms of hue or in terms of value. Um, it's, it's really hard to give kind of one size fits all. Um, usually within a palette, if you don't have some ranges of value, it's going to be hard to see. Um, even if you have a wide range of hues, so let's, let's go to our color wheel here. If you have only, actually, you know what? Actually, this is a good, I got accordion oh. as an example here. Can I hold for This is predominantly dark. I don't want to open up the whole thing, okay. just a little bit. This is predominantly darks, but you can see that we've got some medium um, values in there as well. And, and you can see in the blocks like this that are just darks, it's harder to see. It doesn't mean you can't see it at all. It, it's, it becomes like a low volume sort of quilt, which is an option, but um, you'll notice that we don't have any lights in here and we don't have any um, like pinks or lavenders. There's no pastels in here. So uh, you need to have contrast. It can be hue or value or saturation or, you know, other, right. if you're using prints, it can be different scales of prints. Right. Um, there are lots right. of options, but you... Um, avoid extremes for the... the or or the opposite, where you your palette is so tight, you can't see the patchwork. Mm -hmm. That's what so. we're trying to avoid. Um, so let's see. Um, somebody asked about saturated colors and whether white would be a good background. White is a good option um, as long as you don't have a lot of super light fabrics in it. And if you're using white as a background, make, I wouldn't use it unless you've pre-washed the colors that are in your blocks because that is yeah. always a danger of a white background is bleeding. Right. Um, the, it, there's, Kathy has a question about um, neutrals. Um, I, I get so many questions, and I know it's just that you want an answer. I get so many, well, what percentage of the palette <laughs> should be neutrals? And, you know, it color just isn't that formulaic, and my taste isn't the same as your taste. 
So it's not, there's no rule, you don't have to do it. It's a suggestion mm -hmm. to um, broaden the way you use color and that sometimes a, throwing a neutral into a palette um, can make it a little bit more sophisticated and a little less rainbowy. Not mm -hmm. that there's not that we don't love a good rainbow. Right, but, but it's, um, it's a different. It, just, it, it broadens. It broadens your options. It, it does. I think that neutrals have a different kind of interplay with saturated colors. If you have two saturated colors by each other, next to each other, or close together. It's like having two very loud people speaking at the same time. Right. And so it may be hard to hear either one. And then neutral is just a little bit of a buffer. Yeah, and I, but I think you know, the overall takeaway from the whole conversation about color is that there isn't one formula, there isn't one answer. And a lot of it is um, that before what I want, it's, this is kind of like a Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, you know. Be, worry less about the proportions and the formulas and the gizmos and all of that, and more about what is the goal of this quilt for you? It, it, do you want it to be soft and pretty? Do you want it to be calm? Do you want it to be vivacious? Do you want it to be bright? Mm -hmm. Because all of those things are what are going to give you the answer. That's so true. And I don't know that when you're asking me, you know, I, I, when you're asking me this, like about how many colors and which color, and I've got this background, and I don't know who you are. Yeah, it's, you know, it's about I the greater context. Yeah. And, and, and I think back to different commissions we've had and we've done a lot of private commissions over the years. And to me, they're always a joy because you get to work with and get to get inside of other people's minds. Right. And there are some, some commissions we've done where one, the client came to us and said, we love your work. You have free reign with one exception. We hate orange. It's like, oh, okay, yeah. we, can, we can work with that. Yeah. No orange and others who are, um, come with a very specific palette that we haven't worked with before and it's a great challenge. So in each of those cases, we kind of are constantly thinking about that, the end product, how do we get there? And so when Weeks is talking about, it, it's, it's hard to answer color questions without that greater context. But you do have it, and you you can ask yourself those questions. And you can look at you can look in your wardrobe. You can look in your home. You can look at, um, you know, if, if you have that painting that excites you, you don't need to use every color in the painting. No. You know, you can you can just take the essence. Like, what is it about that painting, or you know, that fabric? If you're, if you, I think this the the challenge is that like. Um, somebody had a uh, large scale fabric that they loved the colors in and, and they were trying to use every color from that fabric, but that fabric had a background color that was used in much greater yes. quantity. And if you're, that would have been great to have as a background fabric in their quilt, mm -hmm and then use all those other colors in the palette. Yes. You know, but then, but they put it in the palette and so then they couldn't figure out the background color. And I, I think when we're teaching in person or online and people say, I love this, I don't like this, the immediate reaction I have is always, why? I think that statement of I like it or I don't like it is fine but it doesn't advance you. It doesn't, um, whenever you see something that you like or you don't like, we always have to say, ask yourself why, and even try to say it. I mean, you can be silly. If no one's around, you can just talk to, talk to the walls, but speaking or writing down why something works or why it doesn't is a great exercise 
because then that becomes part of your decision making process and you have kind of a dialogue that stays in your head for the future. Somebody would also asked about um, you know, their personal preference that they dislike desaturated colors. So desaturated colors are um, are kind of muddier, like if you look grayed out or muddier. Yeah. So there are a bunch of like this green here is very uh, desaturated. It's not. It's kind of the opposite of neon or like a, or, a bright, or, bright the, color. The, this kind of camel colored is very desaturated. Right. So desaturated as opposed to. Can you hold up that? So can oh, you hold oh side by side. So. They're different colors, but you can tell that this is a more saturated palette. This is brighter, um, more luminous, and this is dustier. So somebody said, well, you know, how do I, I find that I don't like those colors. What, how can I prevent myself from buying them in the color in the future? Uh, because I don't like them when they're in my, my stash. And a lot of it is just learning how to see learning how to see the color and um we've there's been a, a bunch of uh comments back and forth about uh color wheels and our advice about color wheels and i want to kind of clarify that mm -hmm. um because i think that is part of this broad discussion and we use um a color wheel that um bill developed um that we use this to teach color. Uh, we don't use this. The color wheel is always kind of permanently in our brains. Um, so we don't use it when we are, it's a communication tool. Yeah, it, we use it to explain and analyze decisions to help other quilters understand what's going on. We don't use it as a planning tool to pick colors. And there's kind of a small industry within the quilting world of color pickers and color wheels that it's also in the paint in the, in the, in the hobby painting world. hobby painting world as yeah. well because there are relationships that can be specified the analogous the triads the complementary colors but those never take into account proportion the role in the quilt or in the painting fabric. and so they are helpful communication tools, but we don't find them to be necessarily as helpful as pl for planning. There are, and, and um, the, the reason is that it's kind of like, I was trying to figure out when I was walking the dog how to explain this. And it's kind of like if I had a strawberry, a bunch of strawberries, and I wanted advice from a cook on how to, what to use the strawberries with. And, you know, there was, they said like, oh, you should use it with um, whipped cream or, you know, short, short, strawberry shortcake. That is a definitely an option. But you can also use it in a spinach salad with balsamic dressing, yeah. or you can use it with rhubarb, or you can you can use it in so many other ways as well. That yeah. what concerns me about when people get into the formula, they want to do math, uh, the math of chemist of uh, of color, and saying, but you know the color th that isn't in the triad. It it it. it it, it narrows your choices mm -hmm. um, to an extent that I th feel like you're gonna you're gonna miss out on ninety percent of the opportunities yeah. if you follow those color wheels. And if they but help, if they yeah. help you, yeah. And if you if if it makes you feel better, um, go ahead. But. We were kind of hoping that maybe you'd, if you're in this, the quilt along, that you would try our process for the quilt along yeah. and see if you can learn from the videos because we feel like it's going to give you mm -hmm. a broader skill set. And we, that's the goal. That yeah, That's why. And we totally understand that you make different quilts in your life at different times where you have more or less energy to be experimental 
and you know Kathy talks about gravitating towards the brighter vivacious and that maybe you're doing it on automatic pilot I think I think we all get into autopilot at times and one of the phrases that I think helps us constantly is not to look at the color but to look at the role of the color yeah. in the quilt yeah and I we led a very large class many years ago where it was very unusual and that everyone was working with the same palette and we bought fabric ahead of time and it was one of the hardest fabric purchases for me because I really disliked the color one of the main colors of the quilt but I loved it in the quilt I loved the role of it but we had to buy a whole bunch of bolts and they're sitting in our studio. And I just like, I don't like that color, but I loved the role of that color. Yeah. And they're, they're different things. And I, I think that uh, it's, as, as Weeks was using the food analogy, kind of, there are, molecular food chemists who have developed these huge books of chemical compounds mm -hmm. that list what foods should work with what but that doesn't mean they always will they don't know what that meal what meal your dessert is following yeah. just because a pairing sh could work doesn't mean it works in every context so i think Food pairings are similar to color pairings that, that and, and I even sometimes get, it work, yeah. I even get frustrated with the people who who go into the cool color, warm color, and it's like, you know, if, if, if you can just step back and strip all of that away and understand the basic concept that analogous colors are next to each other, and are generally calmer when used together. And complementary colors are across from each other on the color wheel. Um, understand hue, value, and saturation. And then just put everything else aside. Because a lot of that color theory is meant for painters. And it, it fab and, and they're they're not necessarily using prints and it, it, it is more complicated if you're using prints. But the other thing is that, um, you know, Bill is an art professor and I asked him when the, the discussion of color wheels came up, whether any, he knew any painters who used those color, color wheel pickers. And no. yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's just, None. yeah. So if you want to use those tools, feel free to use those tools we don't encourage it because we're trying to it's kind of like you can use a calculator but we'd like to teach you how to do the arithmetic i i you know? I, I had an engineer grandfather yeah my, my engineer grandfather who was born in 1899 uh, he's no longer alive, but he was an engineer in the time of slide rules. And when calculators came out, I was a math kid. And one of the first things he said is, great tool, but you should know the approximate answer before you start the calculation so that you know if you've gone drastically wrong. Or you've accidentally and, hit the, the, the decimal point. And, and <laughs> I feel like color wheels are similar. They can help give you a general guidance. You might know a general area, but it doesn't it's not about that exactness all always and and again seeing comments patricia i'm so glad that you're developing your ability to use words to describe what you like yeah. and don't like because that will serve you very well and um i also i'm looking at, at kathy's comment that uh several people in your family prefer monochromatic and if you start very monochromatic or very analogous, sometimes if you just tiptoe outside of, you don't have to go crazy different, but sometimes you just add something that's a little bit, again, I'm going to use the food analogy, maybe a little more sour or a little more sweet than expected. Not so much that it sticks out, but just enough that it, there's an interesting 
aspect to your color work, I think that's often satisfying. I think even within monochromatic though, you can include, again, once you decide, going back to explaining, if you're going monochromatic and you're just using, you know, one part of the color wheel, let's see if I can, I need two hands for this. <laughs> let's just say you're gonna do green or whatever. If you're doing gr just green, you can really use the, a full range of values if you're just using one hue. It The challenge comes when you're using all of the hues and all mm -hmm. of the values. Oh, yes. So if you're, if you want to do something that's monochromatic, you can include some dustier blues and some brighter blues. And a, yeah. you, know, you, you can really explore a little bit more because you, it's gonna be unified by the fact that it's blue. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's fun. So um, yeah, I think uh, people's color, uh, Bon Goodrich's comment about um, color preferences changing I, I agree. I, yes. I feel like um, there are definitely um, some, you know, I can pretty much say I'm never going to do a neon line. Yeah. I, I, the just, neon for me is just, it's tiring, yeah. you know, and, and I, I... And there will be people whose lines are always neon because that yeah. energizes them. Exactly. And, but also, as you, you mentioned, that as we age, we do see color differently. And I think that it's extremely hard for, like, conceptually to realize that every single person sees color differently. Yes. That color yeah. is absolutely not just, I'm not just talking about the taste is personal, but, but optically we see color differently. And this is one thing that really, as an art professor, design professor, is so fascinating to me when I have, I've had so many colorblind students over the years, so many students who really see color differently. And that, uh, I'm also thinking about one commission we had where it was for a couple and she loved color. He was red, green, colorblind. They wanted a quilt for their bedroom. And so we had to design, or we decided to design a quilt where the color work was fantastic, but also it worked kind of in a value scale for him. So they both, saw, they, they would have seen different quilts. Fortunately, they both loved it, but what, what a fun challenge. I think, and the thing is, and you know, it's so, gosh, if my design professors could hear me saying this, <laughs> because I was that person. I, I wasn't a designer until I turned 30 and you went to graduate school for it. So I wanted, I wanted the answer. I wanted to, I wanted design to be a linear process. I didn't want to sit there feeling like I was just spinning my wheels, uncertain of what direction to go. Right. Um, but I think there is some value in understanding that there isn't one answer. Yeah. That, that uh, you may need to look around at like, Walk all the way around that color wheel. <laughs> and it's one of the things yeah. I love about this quilt along with so many people here on Facebook is that you get to see how many possible like solutions or approaches exactly. there are. And, exactly. and, and so the, uh, th there are some incredibly gorgeous, subdued, mm -hmm. monochromatic approaches. There are some maximalist print yep. approaches. And... I think that each of you uh, is making just an enormous number of decisions in a yeah. great way. And, yeah. and it actually informs how we design. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, for the people who are, uh, who are struggling with their background fabrics, don't be afraid to play with your blocks. Maybe take, you know, sort them into ones that have dark fabrics, ones that have light fabrics. Look at look at different options with not all of the blocks, but maybe just some of the blocks. And so you can see if there's some 
fabrics that you've incorporated into your palette that are maybe giving you a hard time now. And you don't have to make all your decisions now. You're already, you have installment four. There are only six installments. I say only, so you've done a lot of yeah. work. But as when the reveal comes, you may tweak decisions a bit more. It's a mystery quilt is absolutely different from any other quilt in that you're kind of trusting the process, you're learning as you go, but you don't have the entire context yet. Um, but you're getting there. But I would really encourage you um, if you are, there are a bunch of people who um, uh, maybe thought they had more yardage than they had and then they're needing to incorporate other mm -hmm. colors. If you can just map out on your design wall or you know scrap of paper or whatever your lightest your brightest your darkest and your dullest your you know most desaturated colors and if you're going to add fabrics ha put them within those ranges so don't do something that's brighter don't do something you, than, than what you already have so you're kind of trying to fill in the blanks I guess is the way yeah. to think about it. That's a good, good. I wouldn't. I wouldn't take your palette in a new direction. That's exactly at it. this point. As as we said during the campfire tra chat, stay on the trail. Yes, <laughs> and, exactly. And I I do think that one of the great things about this mystery is the sheer quantity um, of of blocks that you're making is going to really help lead to success. Believe me. We we um we talk about we talk about you all all the time because we're trying to design for you to be successful, and so we've taken a lot of this into account. And we've also tried to figure out how we can say things in a new way that makes it easier for you to yeah. grasp these concepts. Because yeah. the thing is that once you see it, you'll never not be Un able to see it. And we were so, talking this morning about a student who had been. The, the fourth time she showed up, this was when we were teaching in person, she showed up at a lecture at a guild, and I saw her and said, I'm surprised to see you here. I know you've, you've heard me give this lecture several times. She said, I'm still trying to figure it out. And at the end of it, she said, it all came together tonight. I've heard what you've said, but hearing it is not the same as hearing it, trying it, experiencing it. Processing. questioning it, processing yeah. it. And so it, sometimes we may be a bit of a broken record repeating things, but we're hoping that it'll percolate. So um, a couple of other questions. Um, so fabric requirements, we gave those at the beginning of the, um, uh, of the pattern. And you'll use equal amounts and, throughout the installment, and, except for the background fabric. And a lot of it, but at number six, you may need to, there may be, may be more blocks. I don't you, think, I, I think. Oh, you've, you've. I, I, I change, we're always changing things. No, I, he's I, always I, changing things. Let's be clear. I think, I think we're, we're, I'm, I'm trying to keep everything pretty equal. Okay. So, so. Then you have, uh, then half, and again, it's so hard because it depends on how many colors you have and, but. Um, if for four through six, it will be similar to one through three, to one through three, plus the background fabrics. And once again, you, you see that you can use all sorts of scraps. There are a lot of little pieces yes, exactly. and we're trying to be, um, aware of that. So I think if you follow the general recommendations at the beginning, you, you should be in good shape. Yeah. So I hope that this um, uh, explanation of, you know, to answer some of your color questions, I hope that that has given you options. Um, I think, I really do think that that palette building part two video shows a lot of examples and I actually do draw on yes. the color, our little color wheels, just as an example to help you understand the way I'm seeing it in my brain. Um, as I said, if you weren't here at the beginning of the video, I wanna just uh, reiterate the um, 
our e-commerce part of our website is down because the credit card processing company is having an issue. It's a large company. Um, we are sort of in um, on hold yes. until their uh, their computer scientists um, figure out what the problem is on their end. Um, we often get, when this happens, many well-intentioned emails from people saying, my son's in IT and he can help you out. And <laughs> yeah. th th this isn't a, this... It's not on our it's end. It's not on our end. So It's the credit card processing that's the issue right but now. But we're, we're moving it forward, so... Uh, but it's going to be, um, it sounds like it's going to be a few more days. Yeah. We're so, um, if you wanted to join the summer camp, Modern Mystery, and um, you're... Uh, waiting to register. Hang we, in there. We will let you know the second <laughs> we go. Um, obviously, this isn't something we plan, and it's, it's an enormous headache for us. So um, please be patient um, as we uh, wait for them to do their jobs, and uh, we'll be rolling soon. And thank you all for keeping such kind of great camaraderie going on uh, Facebook and for your questions. That you you, you, you're thinking that only people doing the mystery quilt are trying to... Oh, no, but that's what we've talked about so much. <laughs> well, we have, yes. we, have, we, have, we, have, we have other quilts to show you from our yes. new design, Delight line, but given that the e-commerce site was down, I thought we'll, I'd, hold I'd, we'll, we'll, we'll hold them back until next time. Yeah. But... Um, we will see you um, on August 1st, um, for those of you who yeah. are not doing the quilt along. And um, we hope that you will, if you're down south in that heat wave, that you stay will cool. stay cool. And for those of you dealing with the, uh, the wildfire smoke, our, our skies are finally clear after just a couple days. So I hope that um, those of you who are mm -hmm. dealing with that can have some good sewing time inside. So, so take care, everyone. Yes. Great, great to be with you all. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.